Hello again, everyone. So we finally made it to the final video of this Build Your Own Radar series. So far, we've covered radar hardware. We've talked about CW radar, FMCW radar, synchronizing chirps, and CFAR targeting. And now in this video, we'll cover multiple chirp FMCW, range stopper plotting, and then put everything together into a real radar and use it to track a car and a bike and even a small drone. Okay, so, so far, we've been transmitting these linear frequency modulated chirps, and we're just doing that over and over and looking at the beat frequency that they produce. And that is very interesting, but it gets even more interesting if we start keeping track of the chirps. So if we number the chirps and keep track of what data we receive from each of them, then we'll be able to see how that data is changing from chirp to chirp. And so what we do is we take these chirps and we're gonna arrange them into columns. So we take a chirp that we've received and that we've done the match filter on and we separate it out and arrange it as a column. And we do that with all of our chirps. So for example, say we have six chirps. So that will give us six columns of data. And let's compress those columns together. So we have our six chirps and it gives us this 2D matrix of data. The matrix is N rows by M columns where N is the number of data points per chirp and M is the number of chirps. So that matrix goes from zero to N minus one, and then from zero to M minus one. So for us, M is six, and as shown here, N is nine. And if you think about it, we now have time on the Y axis, but we also have time on the X axis. And so to prevent any confusion, I'm going to label the time on the Y axis, I'm gonna call that fast time. And the time on the X axis, I'll label slow time. It's called slow time because if you look across each of the columns, those data points are all separated by the pulse repetition interval, which is on the order of milliseconds. But on the Y axis, fast time, those data points are all separated by the sampling rate of the data converter. So that'll be something like microseconds or less. That's why we call them fast time and slow time. So hopefully that is clear. This is all really important to get straight in your head. It basically forms the foundation for all kinds of radar processing. Okay, so now we have this 2D matrix of our chirp data. And we've seen in past videos that if we do an FFT on one chirp of data, that we will get the range. So that is still true. We can do an FFT on any of these columns and we will get range. So none of that has changed. So doing that for all of the columns now gives us range on the y-axis and slow time on the x-axis. So again, nothing new here. We've just organized the chirps such that we're showing the beat frequency, which corresponds to the range of each chirp. But by putting them together like this, we now have a matrix of signal strength across range at regular time intervals. And those regular time intervals are of course the pulse repetition rate. So if we look across each row, we are seeing how that range is changing over time and range changing over time is velocity. So to get velocity, we take another FFT, but this time we go across the columns and in radar terms, we call that velocity, we call that Doppler. And we can do both of these FFTs in one fell swoop by using a function called the two-dimensional FFT. This function exists in Python or MATLAB or whatever, and it just generates this transformation very cleanly. So for our radar data, applying a two-dimensional FFT to our fast time, slow time matrix will return a new matrix with range on the y-axis and velocity or Doppler along the x-axis. And so the programming for this range Doppler plot is very easy. We just separate out the chirps into columns and then apply a 2D FFT. The timing to separate out those chirps is something we covered in a previous video in this series. So if you haven't seen that, you can go back and watch that. The timing is very important because that timing is what we use to calculate the velocity. So each toggle of this GPIO burst on the Raspberry Pi is going to kick off a long sequence of phase synchronous LFM ramps. And it gives us this long buffer of data, which is going to contain all of the chirps. And then we just break that buffer into individual chirps and apply the 2D FFT to that. So let's go ahead and try that now. Okay, so this is what those range Doppler plots look like. So this is a video of some street traffic. So a car with a big radar cross section and a bike with a bit smaller cross section. I'll just let this play for a bit so you can get a feeling for the display of data on these range Doppler plots. Each frame or update of this range Doppler plot uses 128 FMCW chirps. So the Y axis is a range and that goes from zero meters to 40 meters. And of course, zero meters corresponds to the phaser radar, which you can see mounted on that table. 
and then the velocity is just taken from the FFT of range across multiple chirps. That velocity is plotted on the x-axis in meters per second, but I'm just noticing now that the x-axis labels got clipped off, uh, so sorry about that, but that is velocity in meters per second, that's, that's what it's supposed to say. And you can see that the right half of the screen is positive velocity, so these would be targets moving away from the radar. And the left half of the screen is negative velocity, so targets moving towards the radar. There's a big line right in the middle of the screen, and that corresponds to zero meters per second. And we have a name for things moving at zero meters per second, and that name is stationary. So this is all the stationary items, and we call all those things ground clutter. We could try to filter this out, uh, or sometimes we'll put a notch filter around zero meters per second to just delete all of that. And when I show this plot with the drone target, I'll put that notch in so that you can see what that looks like. But for this plot, I wanted to leave all the ground clutter in there so that you could see what was the raw processing of the range Doppler two-dimensional FFT. You'll also notice that at a range of zero meters, that there's a point there that is very bright. And that is not due to ground clutter, but instead it is due to the transmitting antenna leaking directly into the receiver array. So this could be greatly improved by isolating the transmit and receive antennas. But on a CW radar system, there's always some leakage from transmit to receive. And that is because in a CW system, both transmit and receive are on at the same time. And of course, our transmit power is going to be much higher power than anything we could back on the receiver. So it's very common to see some kind of bright point at zero velocity and zero range. So that is interesting, and hopefully it is a good example to explain what range Doppler plotting looks like. But I really want to try this radar out on a small drone, so let's try that next. So this is the drone that we are going to track. It is a very small drone. It is the DJI Mini 3 Pro. It is 249 grams and completely made of plastic. And of course, here is the phaser radar that we'll be using. I've attached a Pasternak X-band horn antenna to it. I've tried a few different antennas, uh, like the Vivaldi that comes with the phaser kit, as well as some patch antennas, and all looked more or less similar, at, at least for the stuff that I'm doing. But certainly this horn antenna is the best for single channel transmit. But before we try radar on it, I also want to show you what our transmitter waveform and power output look like. This is a field clock spectrum analyzer from Keysight. A spectrum analyzer plots the RF power versus frequency. So basically the same as what we were doing when we took our FFTs, although this is a vastly better implementation than what we can do with Pluto. And this spectrum analyzer can plot that power over a frequency range from nearly DC all the way up to 26 gigahertz. So that's quite a bit more frequency range than what our phaser and Pluto can do. And that frequency range allows us to see the complete picture of transmit power, as well as transmit frequency and any other spurs that we are transmitting on. And you can see that there is only one frequency spike on this plot, which is great. That is our transmit frequency of 10.3 gigahertz. There are no other spurs that peak above the noise floor of minus 60 dBm. So that's great. That is exactly what we want. But you can also clearly see that the transmit power is only about minus 3 dBm. So that is one half of one milliwatt. That is very low output power for a radar. A normal CW radar for drone tracking might be something like 10 to 50 watts. So that's tens of thousands of times more output power. Now we could easily increase the output power of phaser by adding an amplifier. Uh, and maybe I'll do that in a future video. But really the goal of these videos is to show you how to do this, or at least the basics on how this works and how to get started. So I'll probably just leave the improvements and perfections up to you and your project. There is always so much more that you could do, uh, both on the hardware side and on the software side. Okay, so let's try out Phaser and see how well it can spot a small drone. So here's that small DJI drone flying around in my backyard. The total depth of my yard is about 20 meters. And as the drone moves back and forth, you can see it as that small bright spot. You can also see its propeller signature. That is called micro Doppler. This is due to the propeller blade spinning. So even when the drone is stationary, you can still easily distinguish it from the ground clutter by those spinning propeller blades. And the micro Doppler signature turns out to be important data that people use to distinguish and classify drones. We also saw micro Doppler with the car and bike video, and that was from the wheels rotating. So feel free to rewind back to that and see if you can spot the micro Doppler in that video. But it wasn't quite as bright or noticeable as these drone propellers. Okay, so hopefully that was cool and a good look at how to use this range Doppler plotting.
One final thing before I close out this video, and that is this thing called the Radar Data Cube. You may have heard of it before or run across it elsewhere. It's a very common thing that radar people like to talk about. So what is it? Well, right now we have a radar data plane. It's fast time and slow time for one antenna elements. But we could add another axis, and that axis is the number of receivers. And each new receiver brings with it a new data plane. So here's what a second receiver would look like. And we can add a third receiver. And of course, we can keep adding antenna elements. And so now it's kind of starting to look like a cube. Uh, technically, the shape is a rectangular cuboid, but everybody just calls it the radar data cube. And with the data cube, you can slice it up in interesting ways. So here's a slice that is just one element. And here's a slice that is all of the elements in one chirp. And here's a slice that is all of the elements in one range bin. And I should point out that the cube rotates based on what you want to emphasize, which means that unfortunately there is not a consistent way to look at representations of the cube. Any of the sides could be chirps or time samples or antenna elements, but you can see that each of these data cubes has all three of those things. The number of chirps, the number of samples per chirps, and the number of receivers. And actually, the Radar Data Cube is a nice segue into what I hope will be my next video series, and that series will be on phased array beamforming radars. And here's a little preview of what that is going to look like. So this is a true two-dimensional scan while operating the radar, and it takes advantage of the phased array's ability to electronically steer the antenna. So in this next video series, I'll show you how to do this, and we'll use all the receive elements on phaser to learn some beamforming fundamentals. And then we'll apply those fundamentals to this radar system. So with that, we can do true two-dimensional plots of range and cross-range. We can do star imaging. We can do adaptive cancellation algorithms, just all kinds of cool stuff. But that is all going to be in the next series. So I hope you enjoyed this series, and thank you again for watching.